name is Raelis, and today I will try to cover microphone and architecture topic and to look more closely from technical point of view, how this micro microphone and architecture works and how it's achieved. Uh, before I start, I want to mention that microphone ends are real, so you can already today create solution based on this architectural principle. And the uh, second thing I want to mention, I'm not, and now I'm going to use a very trendy word nowadays, I'm not an influencer, I'm not here to try to push everyone to use this architecture. Uh, yeah, during my speech I will mention microservices and microphone and a lot, but uh, that's not a universal thing that works for all and every use cases. Uh, I have mastered this architecture for some while and I'm, I'm quite satisfied with the outcome and results. Therefore, I'm here to share my findings from using and migrating from uh, monolithic application and moving towards microphone and architecture. Today, actually, I'm on the mission not just to popularize microphone and architecture, but also give some brief introduction on the company named Nest Digital Engineering, which is I'm representing also today. And it's a global company that provides full lifecycle digital transformation solutions. I have to double check on the poster behind me if I'm not lying and everything seems accurate. Uh, yeah, we are a global company. If you see in the employees count, it's not that big. We have three and a half thousand plus employees around the world. But I think we cover quite many regions around the globe. For example, North America, Europe, and Asia. Of course, we have also one delivery, delivery center here at Riga. Uh, the office actually is not located that far from here. It's at uh, Yamanateka. And uh, we have around, I think, 60 people in total in the Riga delivery center. And uh, I think this slide will be more interesting for software engineers, as I have listed some of our technologies we are using and strategic partners. Probably from the uh, icons uh, you already noticed that we are mainly focused on uh, cloud technologies and cloud solutions. Our main focus is on AWS, Amazon Web Services, and which is also one of my main expertise here at the company. I have to mention that one of our offerings is also provides uh, artificial intel intelligence and machine learning, uh, which is, I think, quite a, a topic nowadays. Regarding our technical stack, well, uh, yeah, you name it. Uh, there is a lot of variety. We are covering many different technologies and uh, languages. Uh, more specific, specifically for front-end, for the projects I have participated in, we mostly use the Angular framework. But uh, there are still some uh, React experts in our company that build solution based also on React tool. About me, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Rainis. Uh, we'll try to not spend much more time on introduction as the topic is quite broad and we have limited time. Anyways, I have listed the links below. Uh, so if there is some something interesting to share, or is there, is there any questions, slides, please feel free to reach out to me on those platforms. And yeah, regarding the nice digital engineering company, you can also find on the website, looking there. Um, I was looking on the previous Dev Club events, and I noticed that microphone and uh, topic wasn't covered before. Therefore, for today's speech, I will give like some brief introduction what microphone and architecture is, what's the main motivation for company to adopt such uh, architecture principle, and also we'll share some code examples uh, uh, looking more closely to the technical implementation side, and uh, as probably every architectural decision, uh, there is some trade-offs. And uh, I will list some key points or uh, considerations you should take into account when you are starting to work with micro front ends. So, what really is 
micro front end. We can think of it as an independent micro web of applications. Uh, in most cases, it might be semi independent. Uh, framework in this case is not important. Only a required condition is that it needs to be in JavaScript. And uh, it's so simple. Uh, it's not a secret that this micro front end architecture is deeply inspired from microservices. Therefore, upcoming examples, I will mention also a lot of microservices architecture. So, if we are looking at uh, standard or uh, monolithic web of application, comparing to that, we get, gain some independence. Uh, so, we get independent teams that could work on different tools. They probably have some uh, competence levels on different tools they are choosing. And uh, one important part we get is code isolation. So each of these micro front end application has its own code repository, it has its own CI pipelines, it has its own delivery cycle and pace. So we get quite independent uh, frameworks uh, to be working together. And one more important thing when it comes to maintenance, imagine if there is some breaking framework change or any other breaking change on some external package uh, so we can do all this refactoring incrementally one micro front end by, by, by micro front end so thus allowing us to do some incremental change and uh, reduce the amount that we are trying to develop uh, for, one, for one release uh, so what's the really motivation for company to adopt so the first I think the most obvious is team size so if there are many developers or even multiple teams working on the same code base it's quite cumbersome and uh, comparing to the uh, comparing to the microphone and architecture we got smaller deployments the artifact or the change that we are trying to deploy is a quite uh, smaller comparing to monolith application and it gives us uh, more stability so in case of some uh, issue or even disaster it's easier, much easier to trace the changes we have deployed on and roll back them if that's necessary uh, before looking more closely to the implementation side one more uh, topic that we need to cover from theory and uh, yeah, want to mention that all the examples are based on single page application. So if we are navigating from one view to another, there is no full page refresh. So otherwise, I think it's not interesting anymore to discuss the how microphone and will work. And uh, from theory, uh, one important part is the view composition. So there are two kind of ways how we can structure the view and create a composition of the specific layout. On the left hand side you can see horizontal split. It means that multiple uh, micro front end applications are loaded in one view. However, on the example, on the right hand side we see vertical split. So all, basically we shift all the responsibility to, for specific team to serve and create the final view on that page. And I think it gives a bit more flexibility and uh, reduce the uh, communication that is done between the different teams. Teams, and uh, yeah, I think in kind of that way we can deliver changes even more faster, as we don't have that much uh, communication and dependency on the other teams. So I think uh, we are ready to look at more deeper implementation part. And uh, I have listed here four, four necessary components you need to create when, we are, when you are working on micro front ends or microservices. And uh, here I will, I will closely compare it with uh, microservices. So the first and I think the most obvious is uh, URL. We need to have unique URL for each micro front end or microservices. In that case, we can distinguish which microservice endpoint we should call or which micro front end part we want to load. And regarding hosting, uh, we have actually quite plenty of rooms 
plenty of room to uh, to deploy the application as uh, one of the microphone and application could be stored on AW, AWS S3 bucket and some other microphone and application could be hosted completely on different web server. So here actually are quite many possibilities how we can deploy each of the microphone and application. Only thing that yeah, we need some unique URL so we are able to load the application. And uh, once we get those two things, uh, probably we want to somehow aggregate all the micro parts, micro services, micro front end applications in the same, uh, in the, into sort of like one application or one unit. And here comes the point uh, for the entry point. It's, it's the initial load. Uh, for microservices, it could be some Nginx uh, configuration. Apache or load balancer that receives incoming traffic and depending on the road it, it proxies the request to the subsequent uh, uh, microservices. Uh, in the micro front-end application world it's quite similar and uh, that responsibility is moved to the specific micro web application. Usually it has its own name, it's called shell or host application and uh, it's really a small application uh, that doesn't hold any business logic it's only responsible to load the data and uh, basically the application will hold the array of all, all the roads that the application have and then depending on the road it's able to, uh, to connect to the specific microphone and application and thus allows us to serving uh, the final application which usually it's called shell or host as mentioned earlier and uh, at some point we probably want to commun communicate between microservices or micro front -ends. Uh, in microservices world probably you will use some event bus like uh, simple notification service, simple queue service etc uh, for front micro front -ends, it's uh, also quite a few options we can choose one obvious we can use URL so we can append some data on query parameters thus allowing to all the micro front ends to share the data between different builds another thing that is shared across all the micro front ends is local storage so we can persist some data on local storage and thus also we can exchange the data between different micro front end applications and uh, the last want to mention that also we have window object uh, so which is also shared between all the micro front ends so if there is necessity to store some global data that is accessed from and updated from multiple micro front end applications we can use window object and store them under some object and uh, but here comes a bit tricky part uh, regarding reactivity so for Angular World, for example, we using, for example, MGRX store uh, to share data between different uh, component parts, uh, between different application parts, and it's based on observables. For UX, uh, for you, we can use Pinio or UX store to change the data, and for React, we probably can use Redux. So which which tool of this we want to use and uh, the answer is probably none of them because the main goal of micro frontend is to be framework agnostic so if one team decides to be working on angular another team wants to be wants to try to work on you we should allow that and therefore we cannot like base the global store implementation on some simple framework uh, agnost uh, framework uh, this solution therefore we should rely on our vanilla JavaScript skills and uh, either you are able to create your own uh, event messaging service or use al already existing some Node.js uh, npm packages that does pu publishing and subscribing events as 
Example I can mention, for example, if you have authentication micro front end uh, which stores the which is able to share the data between other micro front end applications and it's sharing the active authorization token. So in that case we can on, if the user is successfully logged in, we can dispatch custom event um, and that way this host application could listen to specific action, for example, authentication success, and thus uh, redirecting user to the next screen. And this this is how the singular responsibility principle is applied, so that authentication microphone and application is only responsible for authorization. And uh, to communicate between different parts, yeah, we can use custom events, listen to them, and uh, do the necessary logic. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, every architecture has its own trade-offs. And unfortunately, my front-end is not an exception. Uh, when I was thinking why maybe this uh, architecture is not that widely used, or at least we haven't heard that much about that, one thing that comes to my mind is the mindset change. So we have been building uh, monolith front-end applications for years. Uh, we, have, we are experts at that. Uh, we know how to structure the code, how to deploy, how to communicate between different parts of the application. And uh, then, then uh, comes new architecture principle. And it's quite hard for us to switch between those two different principles. Uh, a lot of things changes, how we structure the code, how even we structure the things in the company, or how we com communicate between different parts of the application. And I think this is quite hard and it takes uh, some time to adapt to it. Uh, luckily for me, when I was starting a uh, migration from Monolith from an application to uh, using this uh, microphone and architecture principle, we didn't have strict deadlines when this project would go live. So we used uh, multiple iterations <laughs> until we were sure that, or, and uh, uh, we, we were like, uh, we were happy about the results that we saw and uh, that allows us to incrementally improve the project and uh, scale the microphone and application. And uh, here I think also the confidence kicks in, like if you are starting a new project, uh, you don't have that much knowledge base be before that, and, and you probably have some deadlines for the project, and uh, it's quite hard probably for the uh, project management to understand when the project would go live, and uh, how for the developers to move forward with implementing such uh, architecture. Uh, later on, I will show some code examples and what is required from configuration point of view. But uh, initial setup complexity is much higher than uh, going with some standard Angular monolithic application or any other framework monolith application. And uh, as you have different teams, teams could use different tools stylings, components, it has its own development uh, and release cycles. Sooner or later we will get some inconsisten inconsistencies across the application. And uh, yes, of course it takes some time to adopt and fix those issues to make the final uh, product to feel and uh, look the same across the entire application. So how does it look in real life? Um, here is quite simple example. So here you can see the shell application. On the left hand side there is simple navigation that holds active user information and uh, each of the navigation loads different parts of the microphone and application. Uh, not sure if everyone sees but this application is running on localhost 3000 port. And uh, if we take take example on the next slide we see we can see the same user list table but only difference now it's running on port 3003 so 
basically those are two independent applications and uh, going a step further uh, looking back again to the host application or the shell application here we see uh, how login form or how authentication microphone then could look and uh, here again we see the same basically the same view but uh, it's again okay running on different port in this time 3002 uh, from this basically we can conclude that we can run each of these microphones and separately and uh, we don't need to build and run all the microphones if we are just running or working on uh, 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 in this case uh, authentication microphone and uh, maybe comparing to the monolith how it will look so for example if you are trying to make changes on this login form uh, usually you would build whole monolith application you would run all the unit tests for whole application running all static analysis code tools and running end to end tests for whole suite and uh, comparing to microphone then for us if you are concerned only for login form for you is enough to work and uh, start only this uh, one part of the application which is uh, authentication microphone and application and uh, we can still run all the unit tests end-to-end -end tests but the uh, code base will be relatively much smaller compared to the big monolith application and uh, in this example I showed only two microphone ends, but it could scale to 10, 15 and 20 microphone ends. Um, so yeah, I wanted to mention that uh, code uh, uh, for transition from standard monolithic application towards uh, microphone and it doesn't work out of the box. There is still, requ still required some configuration and adaptation to make it work. And uh, one of them is module federation and second one is web components and uh, regarding module federation so it's provided by webpack version 5 and uh, we can think uh, as it acts like a, a remote containers that can consume or expose code to the different builds and in the end all those different builds forms the single application uh, taking an example from previous uh, screens so authentication microphone that is one build uh, users mi microphone that is a second build so and the uh, quite important part at this uh, all the logic that everything is done at runtime so there is no need to redeploy shell application or other micro front-end applications for example if you are doing only changes on a login form uh, there is also no need to update npm uh, version uh, npm packages uh, package json file if you are bumping some new version so everything uh, this is done at runtime so if you are for example going to login form we always take the latest version from the authentication microphone and, and thus allowing us to serve the latest content or latest components on that on that screen and important part in this place uh, remote entry.js actually you can rename the file as you want but this is like the standard naming convention for that and uh, it acts like manifest for the micro front end. It holds all the information for exposed modules, dependencies, and uh, yeah, basically all the things that needs to be uh, exported from the web configuration. And on the left hand side, I, I, I show, you can see there is some uh, web configuration example, and uh, basically to make it work for each microphone then you should provide module federation plugin which is exported from webpack file you just provide unique name for your microphone then and you provide which 
modules or components are exposed and could be remotely consumed on the shell application. In this example, I, I expose only one file, but it could use different uh, modules and files. However, on the right hand side, uh, it's a code fragment from shell or host application and it's written on Angular and what it does, it basically serves as the user list table. So we can see that uh, on the remote entry we, we point our application to be loaded from completely different domain and host and thus allowing us to so for that we know that we want to trigger which module and which name and allows us to serve the users list table and uh, yeah basically it looks that that easy for us to make the micro frontends works to be working but uh, uh, in previous slides I mentioned uh, web components so we can think it's like a mix of different technologies that allows us to create reusable custom elements. So probably we all know basic HTML tags, paragraphs, links, inputs, buttons, etc. So we can extend it with our custom HTML tags, um, and it supports which and yeah, basically it's rendered on native browser. And uh, usually you can write them um, either vanilla JavaScript or usually also each framework provides its API that allows us to wrap for example Angular or Vue component with some uh, with some functionality to be able to working with web components so so if you I will later show the examples how it's achieved but uh, one more important thing to know that uh, the components also supports isolation and uh, using shadow root um, we, can we can think it works like an iframe so if you have multiple micro frontends on the same view you don't want them to collision between other either its styles or code so using shadow root we kind of have encapsulated all the component logic in one component and uh, it's not interacting between each other when there is multiple microphone then loaded or between shell or the microphone then application so this is quite important uh, under the hood it looks like following on the left hand side I have uh, added example for the login view and this is basically all the necessary custom code to be needed to, to be written to serve as the login page or login form we saw previously so we just use uh, view single file components and wrap them with uh, API from which is exported from view framework and using custom elements API we can def define our custom HTML type and later on on the native browser we just render it and it works out of the box so there is no need to boot your view or, or anything else it's like a self-container that works in the browser however on the right hand side uh, it's a bit more complex example and uh, this example you probably want to use if you have external dependencies so example if your code is not isolated all the functionality is not isolated in one component and you have some external dependencies for example here to render user list table I have dependency to external prime view component library therefore I'm creating some some sort of micro view application which is mounted to the specific uh, custom element and uh, later on uh, here's the basically the same example but uh, adopted for angular framework on the left hand side we have standalone uh, Angular application well, uh, where all the logic is encapsulated inside one component however on the right hand side we can create more advanced components which could be dependent on uh, Angular material or any other library and we can import those modules 
and once the module is bootstrapped, so we also just uh, defining our custom component and uh, this is how basically the web components are achieved under the hood. So considerations, yeah, there's a few things to keep in mind when, when starting to work with micro frontends and when trying to scale them, the one thing is naming convention. As mentioned previously, there is still some objects or API we are sharing. Therefore, to prevent any collisions, uh, we should use some unique uh, variable names or local storage key prefixes. So usually we provide, it for each microphone and we provide unique prefix, which is microphone and name. Uh, and another important thing is for styles isolation. Previous, previously I mentioned that each web co component could use shadow root, thus allowing us to encapsulate all the logic inside one component. And if there is some global styles it's outside that component, component itself will not be affected. But uh, that's not the usually the case if you have some uh, external dependencies. And here on the right hand side we see that we need to import some CSS files outside our application from Prime U. So in this case to avoid that this file will be affect uh, this file will affect uh, shell application or any other uh, microphone and application, we need to isolate them, encapsulate. So therefore we can use post CSS nested import which allows us to do the following syntax. In this case all the global styles that we are not uh, responsible for or we don't have uh, ability to change them so they are encapsulated only specifically for user application so and it will not affect uh, another microphone and application. And uh, again, uh, best practice also for styles is to prevent global style uh, rules. For example, we try to avoid styling global input elements or buttons as it also could affect all the our web components. And to prevent also the class name collisions, uh, we usually also for each class name we add some prefix or user's authentication, etc. So for each of the component, all the class names are unique. And uh, yeah, once we have application working, we probably need to think how to test it. And uh, there are some, I think there are only two ways how to properly test them. One of them could be just running all the end-to-end -end tests uh, against specific micro frontend so we don't test the integration with a shell application or other microphone and application and in case if there are any external dependencies for example user list table makes HTTP request to the backend and it has to load uh, authorization token from uh, authentication microphone and in that case we simply mock the data and uh, we we rely on that contract that we agreed on when we are defining the micro front ends. And uh, this is the probably the simplest solution how we can test uh, still running end-to-end uh, -end test for the for the application. But uh, if that's not enough, so we still can run also integration tests for uh, when all the shell application or the Micro specific microphone and application are uh, running. So in this case, we can say that uh, all those microphone are orchestrated by shell application. So in this example, for uh, if you are making some changes on payments, uh, microphone and application, we can point to the local host or anything or any other host where the changes are deployed. And for the rest of the application, we can still use the production uh, micro front end parts. So we, in this case, we really don't care uh, what are the changes on the user's micro front end. So we are again testing only payments micro front end, and uh, yeah, this 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 some, some sort of uh, micro front end orchestration allows us to 
define all the en environment variables and testing strategies from the shell application. And uh, again, we avoid that we help to run all the end-to-end -end test suite against whole application. Instead, we can concent concentrate only on the specific uh, microphone application part. So, I think in summary, yeah, we have covered all the necessary components for us to run uh, microphone and application. We, we saw the entry point that is required for to, to form the final view of the application, as well as we discuss how we can achieve the uh, communication between different uh, microphone and parts. Uh, looking at Webpack version 5 module federation, we know how to expose the code and consume it at runtime using also module federation and web components. Uh, yeah, we discussed what is necessary for scaling, for avoiding any variable collision and uh, styles isolation. And uh, yeah, at the last we discussed how we can test properly test our application and assure the quality of that. Uh, thinking uh, how this architecture could evolve in future, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is to improve documentation. As currently I couldn't find very useful documentation that describes best practices, how we can use different frameworks, how we can communicate between them. And uh, there is still a lot of uh, custom code that you write and maintain and therefore I think some sort of microphone and framework could allow us to seamlessly integrate multiple multiple microphone and applications and avoid for us to rely on our JavaScript expertise to, deploy, uh, to for example implement the communica communication event bus and data updating and uh, yeah as example yeah for the home task actually I wanted to give you to think how this uh, architecture could be achieved for server-side rendering. So we have additional layer of uh, complexity and uh, you can, you can find uh, some materials on the internet, it's working, but uh, I think there is, uh, this will be the good topic for the future to cover how the microphone and architecture evolve and we uh, enable the server-side rendering feature. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I know I covered very basic things regarding my content architecture. Maybe there is still uh, maybe some questions or any anyone wants to share his feedback for working on uh, my content architecture. Yeah. I have a question about the <coughs> shell application. Uh, did you write your own from scratch? If so, then what are the reasons and uh, do you, are there <coughs> any good uh, open source solutions that are worth checking out for this? Yeah, regarding shell, I wrote from scratch, and you can use any framework, Angular, Vue, React, or plain JavaScript. As I couldn't find any some boilerplate boilerplate for that, but uh, it's uh, as I mentioned, it's quite small application. There is not much of complexity in that specific application, so therefore, yeah, it's quite easy to write from the scratch. And uh, usually, Angular, I know for sure for Angular and Vue provides API to seamlessly integrate with those micro frontends and uh, to render custom elements as I show by showing previously with Angular example. Yeah. Uh, it, of course uh, you mentioned that it's possible to use whatever framework for each of this uh, micro frontend uh, app but doesn't it make sense to use the same framework uh, to reuse some libraries or styling. Do you use the same framework across the micro front end app or are you use the same? Uh, I, I will take from microservice perspective. I mean, I think also the microservices work gives us the flexibility to define the tools. But I think on the more, at least the, most of the applications or the projects I have worked, all the microservices still using the same stack and they still have some shared libraries, some core functionality they are using. So, answering to the question, uh, probably you will stick to still want the framework as uh, 
but uh, it also once once I was starting, of course, I gave some explanation and demos when I was implementing with different uh, stacks, uh, Angular, Vue, and React. Also, these examples I showed previously, one was working on Angular, Shell was working on Angular, uh, login forum was on Vue, and the user list table was on Angular. So we can really mix, and I think it depends also uh, on the team structure. If your team is not competent on some specific framework, so it gives us the flex flexibility for us to to use different tools. Uh, yeah, I know it sounds a lot. Such variety is not always necessary, necessary, but uh, yeah, at least it gives us flexibility for the future. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned some examples around the authentication token, which is very important for the application. So what would be your uh, recommendation to share it with the other microfrontends? How do you do that? So uh, my example covered that uh, the access token we share with Windows Logic, which of course not safe. Also storing JVD tokens from local storage is also not safe. So basically there is no quite safe place for frontends to store this JVD authorization. You usually Why it's not safe. Uh, cross site scripting. So any third party okay, script the JVD token is uh, open. Like you cannot if you, if you will change it, you will yeah, be but able to decrypt it to encrypt it. Yeah, but you don't want to make uh, if you are in you know, if your project consumes third party library and it can access your local storage. So you probably don't want to make that some random script on your behalf create some uh, HTTP request. Of course, this token for him it doesn't mean anything, but the external script can uh, uh, but the external script can do HTTP request and thus uh, is a uh, basically security threat for us. Therefore. I, w I won't say there is no super safe place to sort store plain JavaScript uh, JVD token. Instead, you probably would use uh, cookies, which is not accessible from frontends, uh, yeah. from storage, and you would use some CSRF protection, cross site scripting protection for that. To, to continue this one, yeah. uh, if we still decide, for example, to store in the local storage, mm -hmm. how other components would know where to find? So we need to rely on the contract. So if we say that, uh, or how it's an event, event driven technology is done, so you rely on the contract. You know that under that key name will be uh, this uh, JVT token store. You probably would create some wrapper on the uh, shell application that does some, some sort of API that allows us to access the local storage but uh, this is basically how you rely on the previously agreed that uh, we store the JVD token on that key on the local storage. But uh, usually, yeah, you would still have some API uh, written on shell application that allows to access the predefined uh, this uh, data. So, micro need to talk to shell application. Yeah, if they want to share the data between them. It's not necess necessarily to talk to shell application, they are talking to the window object. And the window object, they rely on the construct that uh, agreed on, uh, between all the micro frontends and shell applications. So, as uh, using any other JavaScript uh, API, for example, Promise Resolve or Window Locals or JPI. We rely on the contract. So we can create our custom API. Okay. Off. Uh, we can rely on our contract that uh, on that API, on that window object, we will receive the necessary data. Yes?
thing that made me hesitate regarding mobile federation is this new uh, generation of bundlers, like uh, BS Build and uh, Light that uses the, the first one under the hood. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question in this context is even the, now nowadays bigger frameworks even as uh, enterprise uh, type yeah. frameworks, Angular, they are looking into this direction and are adding BS Build as the uh, second option, but the uh, future potentially the main bundler. So the question is this, in this context is, have you explored uh, native browser options? Uh, like there's this impulse map uh, thing that, that is not, uh, doesn't have that good browser as well, but there are polyfills for it. So have you uh, yeah, explored uh, other options to, to get the same thing that Mobile Federation gives you, uh, to be able to have like, scope for packages, versions, and, uh, yeah. version management, and such things, but without depending on uh, yeah, so to be honest, I haven't. Yeah, okay. uh, I know, yeah, a lot of different tools provide its own bundlers. For example, Vue has Vita, but uh, I believe still in the future they will evolve and they will add some functionality that we can uh, consume or expose the code at runtime. But uh, to be honest, yeah, particularly I haven't looked at the other solution besides Webpack and the uh, Module Federation. Okay, yeah. Um, if there is no more questions. Yeah, there. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I have a small question. You mentioned that uh, you're quite satisfied with the results. Yeah. And what are these results and what is the outcome? And the major question is how it affects uh, each cost of delivery. Yeah, of course, yeah. There is a bunch of methods we can apply to make a successful project, right? For us, was the main ability, we have different independent teams. For us to be successful was to provide solution that each of team with, which, with own expertise, they can work on different tools and deliver product uh, independently. So for our success was to get rid of Monolith so that independent teams could deliver, decide its own technology stuck maybe on the site, its own uh, testing strategy to, to, labor, to deliver the product and uh, yeah that's I think was the, our main goal that we wanted to achieve uh, regarding the cost uh, yeah that as mentioned yeah the initial setup was more more time consuming and uh, but uh, to be honest I don't have any specific data how, how our delivery improved or how like the team structure was uh, more satisfied or not, but uh, yeah, but that's a good point. Thank you. Okay. So this is chocolate time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.